All right, guys, how's it going? Tech news tends to slow down somewhat after CES, and we're kind of in a gap just waiting on the next big releases. And I've had one or two requests to get this one done, so I have decided to take a look at this. It is AMD's fourth quarter and the 2017 financial results from the earnings call on the 30th of January. We'll start with this slide, which we have seen before. It is still quite an interesting one, though, as AMD still looks at the PC market as one of their largest potentially addressable markets. But as you know, the real profits are to be made in the data center. I thought this was an interesting slide though, 2017 product innovation. And it's worth pointing out that over the entire year, AMD has launched 10 new products. And by that, they're not just talking about different CPUs or stuff like that. As we can see, we've got Ryzen, Ryzen Pro, which is the business version, Threadripper and Ryzen Mobile. Now you may look at that and think, well, that's only really two different chips. Obviously Ryzen, Ryzen Pro and Ryzen Threadripper all come off of the same Zeppelin die. Whereas Ryzen Mobile is different as it is basically half the Zeppelin die with Vega graphics attached. But there's more to it than just the silicon, because launching a new product requires the marketing behind it, and all that needs to be delivered to schedule in timely fashion. For gaming and graphics, we've got Vega, the Radeon 500 series, and the Xbox One X. And for the data center, that was Epic 1 and 2P platforms, and also Radeon Instinct. They could probably have included the Vega Frontier Edition in that as well. But let's say 10 new products over a year. I don't even think Apple launched 10 new products in 2017. They've done a good job in getting getting these to market on time, with only really maybe Ryzen Mobile slipping slightly. But in all that, that is actually not bad, given their very, very busy schedule. Now moving on to the financials, and we'll start with the whole of 2017, where we see a 25% annual revenue growth to 5.3 billion, which is an increase of over 1 billion on 2016. It's worth noting, however, that 2016 was a pretty awful year for AMD. But while that looks spectacular, as we can see from this chart here, the revenue is only really getting back to where it was before it started going south. Now gross margin is up, driven by computing and graphics. There's been a significant improvement in operating income, and believe it or not, they actually made a profit. The long-term debt was down by $138 million, and they exited the year with cash of around $1.18 billion. Now taking a closer look at the annual summary, as we've already seen, revenue up 25%, gross margin up by 11 percentage points. Again, that looks great. However, last year they also paid Global Foundry a rather large charge, and this contributed to the much lower gross margins. Operating expenses were up by 213 million, but the operating income was up by 576 million. Remember last year was exceptionally poor and did include that very large charge of over 300 million dollars to Global Foundries. So this is why these numbers look better, because of this one-time charge at Global Foundries. As we just learned, they did turn a profit net income of 43 million dollars for the entire year. They were slightly down by $79 million in cash held, but the debt was also down by $40 million. Debt one is quite interesting though, and we can see this by taking a look at the condensed consolidated statement of operations. So going through the important stuff, good to see that R&D is up by $152 million. Over the previous years, AMD's R&D was starting to slip quite dramatically in fact, but they started ramping up R&D again last year, and this will hopefully be seen in future products. Stuff like marketing, general and admin has also increased 51 million dollars, which is a fair amount in fact. And here we can see the operating income of 204 million dollars and the net income of 43. Now that's quite a difference between the operating and the net. And the reason for that mostly comes down to this interest expense that they are paying on their debt. Over the entire year that would have been around 130 million dollars paid in interest on this debt. So that's why there is quite a difference between the net and the operating income. It is worth pointing out though that the interest expense is down quite a bit on a few years ago. And it looks like they are getting it under control. Now looking at the segment breakdown, and again sticking with 2017 compared to 2016, computing and graphics revenue up 54%, over a billion dollars, and they also turned around a 238 million loss into a 147 million dollar profit. Now the EESC, which includes all your game consoles, and of course Epic, revenue there was essentially flat. The reason for that, they haven't really turned in any revenue yet for Epic, just very small amounts, and the operating income here was well down. Now the reason for this is consoles are not selling as well. Your Xbox and your PlayStation 4 are getting pretty old now, and while they did release the Xbox One X, it's safe to say that this generation of consoles is well on its way out. And you've also got stuff there like Nintendo Switch, which is doing extremely well and is undoubtedly cutting into sales. So this is why the Semi Custom hasn't done as well this year. For 2018, the console revenue will continue to drop, but that should be more than offset by sales of Epic. A quick look at the Target Optimal and minimum cash. 
as we saw, $1,185 million, which is around about their optimal target. Obviously, they would rather have more, but as we can see, 95% of this cash is held domestically. And the whole point of this is, if they really needed a billion dollars in a hurry, then they have got it on hand. And we can see a downward trend in the long-term debt. So with that look at 2017 done, we can head over to Seeking Alpha, where AMD CEO Dr. Lisa Su discusses their fourth quarter and 2017 results during the 30th of January earnings call. Now I'm just going to pick out the interesting parts here. As we saw, client computing revenue increased both year over year and sequentially. And they also outperformed seasonality in Q4 based on very strong sellout of Ryzen processors throughout the holiday season. In graphics, they delivered their second straight quarter of record GPU revenue with significantly improved average selling prices and increased unit sales from a year ago. And this was across the entire graphics product portfolio. Now, I think we know what the main reason for this has been. But Lisa said that they saw strong demand for Polaris across both gaming and blockchain markets, while Vega GPU revenue more than doubled from the prior quarter and they actually said last quarter that Vega did better than expected and this time it's been driven by strong gaming demand in add-in board channels as well as strength with strategic OEMs. Now looking at EESC again. As we know, revenue was up by 3% from a year ago, and Lisa says this has been driven by the ramp of their Epic processors. So Epic has had a small effect there on EESC revenue, and she continues that AMD has closed dozens of new server deals in the quarter, and they continue to see a steady drumbeat of adoption for Epic. Before finishing with, our semi-custom business performed as expected in the quarter, as unit shipments declined from a year ago as they completed their fifth year of the current game console cycle. And at the bottom of page two, she reminds us that AMD believes Meltdown is not applicable to AMD processors. While over the page, they continue to actively work with their ecosystem partners on mitigations for Spectre Variant 1, but they continue to believe that Variant 2 of Spectre is difficult to exploit on AMD processors. But with that in mind, they are taking additional mitigation steps by deploying CPU microcode patches in combination with the operating system updates. The next part was quite interesting, I thought, because longer term, they have included changes in their future processor cores starting with Zen 2 to further address potential Spectre-like exploits. I'm sure we'll find out more about that nearer the time. And a little bit further on, she says, later this year, we plan to sample our first 7 nanometer Vega GPU, optimized for machine learning, while also saying that their Zen 2 design is now complete and will also be sampling to customers later this year. So both Vega and Zen 2 sampling later this year, it might mean that we get some kind of benchmarks towards the end of the year, but we shouldn't expect to see any real availability of these products until into 2019. And Lisa finishes off by saying, 2018 is clearly a defining year for the ramp of the server business and they remain focused on their goal of achieving double digit market share in this important market segment. Right now AMD sitting at less than 0.5% market share. Now moving on to AMD's Chief Financial Officer Devinder Kumar who started off by saying that it is particularly noteworthy that the computing and graphics segment was profitable for the first time in six years. And over the page Devinder noted that AMD are adopting a new revenue recognition accounting standard effective this year. Now, now this is very important because AMD now expects revenue to be approximately $1.55 billion in the first quarter of 2018. When I first saw this, I thought that is an awfully big jump, especially over the first quarter of 2017, where AMD's entire revenue was a miserable $984 million. So $1.55 billion would be a massive increase. But as it turns out, the reason for this is their new revenue accounting standards. And effectively, this $984 million of quarter 1, 2017, under the new standard would have been $1.178 billion. So what initially looked to me like an over 50% increase in revenue will in fact only be around a 32% increase instead. I'm saying only, but a 32% increase in revenue is also very, very good. But this was a pretty poor quarter. Remember, quarter 1, 2017, Ryzen had barely even launched. But hopefully that clarifies that point for anyone who was wondering. And the vendor finishes off by saying that for the whole of 2018, they expect double double digit percentage growth in annual revenue. 5.3 billion this year, they'll be looking at around $6 billion in revenue for 2018. And as you can see by looking at this chart, around about the $6 billion mark over the trailing 12 months, 
is where AMD's revenue really ought to be when the company is performing as expected. And that would certainly be far more welcome than down below $4 billion, which is where they have been in recent times. As you're probably aware, after Lisa and Devinda finished their commentary, a bunch of financial analysts asked them some questions in a question and answer session. So take a look at some of the more interesting questions and answers before finishing off the video with my own thoughts. The first thing to note about this session was there were a lot of questions about blockchain. With the first question on that being on the radio side, can you give us a sense of what blockchain was to the contribution. The contribution being the impressive sequential growth in computing and graphics, of which Lisa reminded us was around $140 million. And Lisa says that this was across Ryzen and Radeon, but blockchain in particular is estimated around about one third of that. So that would be around about $47 million to maybe $50 million of that entire growth in computing and graphics was down to blockchain. And she continues with, I'm sure many of you have seen that the graphics channel is very low, and we certainly have seen that, but they are working to replenish that channel environment. A bit further on, an interesting question, an analyst curious if there was any sort of unusual expenses around Spectre or Meltdown that were going on, with Lisa replying that no, there are no particular unusual expenses related to that. Next up, a question with a revealing answer, where the analyst said he's wondering if Lisa could talk a little bit about the product that they had announced with Intel over the course of Q4. That is, of course, the semi-custom graphics product. With Lisa answering, what we're doing is we're selling silicon to them, and then they are packaging that in a multi- chip module that should be, not multi-strip, with Intel doing the marketing and selling it to end customers. This is how semi-custom works. AMD makes a product and sells them the silicon and then Intel can do whatever they want with it. Lisa continues that this is an excellent way to get more Radeon GPUs in as many applications as possible. But the revealing part of the answer was this. Because this graphics revenue is very similar to discrete graphics, they are actually reporting these sales to Intel in their computing and graphics segment. So not in the EESC. Even though this is a semi-custom chip, it is the computing and graphics segment which reports it as revenue. So mildly interesting there I guess. And a little bit of an oddity. That seems a little bit unfair on the semi-custom guys. Next question, once again on crypto. Is there any way that you could give an absolute dollar amount either in the fourth quarter or just the full year of 2017 on what you believe crypto contributed to your revenues? With Lisa starting with, it's hard to estimate, explaining that some of the crypto GPUs are sold through the same channels as our gaming channel. Before finally saying that it's around about mid single digit percentage of their annual revenue, maybe just a little bit higher than that. Let's call it a point or so. So I guess you could be talking maybe 7% of AMD's entire annual revenue contributed to crypto which could be around about the 350 to maybe even 400 million dollar mark. And when you think about it like that, almost 400 million dollars, that really is quite a lot of extra revenue. And Lisa finishes with, it is consuming a lot of GPUs. A couple of questions later, yet more on blockchain. But a different kind of question this time as the analyst asks if their foundry partners have enough spare capacity to support them with the ramp of GPUs. And also, is there enough memory to support these cards anyway? And in answering, Lisa once again revealed that the GPU channel is lower than where they would like it to be, so they are ramping up production. At this point, they're not limited by silicon per se, so they've still got wafers to use at Global Foundries, which is something I'll touch on at the end of this video when I give you my thoughts. But she continues with, there are shortages in memory, and that is true across the board, whether you're talking about GDDR5 or high bandwidth memory. And the final question of note was, in terms of the ramp of Epic, should we look at a linear ramp throughout 2018? To which Lisa replied, she does expect the steady ramp of Epic as they go through the year, and their target is to be at mid single digit unit share by the end of 2018. So that's what they're targeting by the end of this year, and she believes that there would be significant revenue from Epic in the second half. So double digit server market share is the aim over the next two two, three years. But by the end of this year, they're looking at mid single digits. And from that, you can pretty much work out the kind of money they would expect to get from that. But that was pretty much it for the quarter four and 2017 conference call. They would be looking at anything between 750 million, even up to a billion dollars in extra revenue from a mid single digit server market share gain. Now to finish off with my thoughts and putting it all together, starting with 2017 as a whole, if you had to ask me to give AMD a mark out of 10 for how they performed in 2017, I would probably say around 7.5. But that's purely talking in financial terms. In terms of how they launched their new products, I thought they did absolutely great. 10 new products throughout the year and really only Ryzen Mobile slipped just a little bit and maybe they didn't quite get as much revenue from Epic as they maybe thought they would have done at the 
beginning of 2017. But in terms of the launches, they did absolutely great. And at first glance, in terms of finances, they did absolutely great as well. But there's simply no getting away from the fact that AMD struggles to make a decent profit. It's satisfying to see the operating income go up past 200 million, which is really quite good. But they are still being weighed down by their debt. And this is something I'd like to see them pay off a bit faster. Paying over 30 million in interest every quarter, that is a lot of money for a company like AMD. So hopefully they can get this total debt down below a billion dollars, maybe by this time next year. As I mentioned earlier, research and development back on the up, which is a necessity in order to compete with the likes of Intel and Nvidia. So that's another plus point there. The big disappointment for me regarding 2017 was I felt that AMD were not nearly aggressive enough. We just saw there that Lisa said, we're not constricted by silicon, talking about the GPUs. But that also means that Ryzen is not constricted by silicon either. And for me, it's disappointing that AMD has not been aggressive enough regarding sales of Ryzen. And we can quite clearly see that Ryzen has been doing some damage to Intel. During Intel's fourth quarter, they revealed that their client computing group revenue was down by 4% over the year. And on the chart, we can see that's around the tune of $300 million. So this is the kind of damage that AMD has done with Ryzen without being particularly aggressive aggressive. And when you think about it, maybe that was actually just the plan. They've taken a nibble out of Intel's market share, barely even enough for Intel to notice a sting. But it does make you wonder what would have happened had they been a lot more aggressive. But it's pretty clear to me now that AMD is not really interested in the very low margin stuff. They're not interested in taking on Intel in terms of the Pentiums and Celerons of the world. But what that does mean is they are not using all of the wafers available to them. As I've talked about in the past, something like 60,000 wafer starts per month over at Global Foundries, of which AMD probably has well over half of that. Yet it would appear that they are not taking up those extra wafers when they've got the chance. On that same topic though, it's good to see that there has been no mention whatsoever of the wafer agreement with Global Foundries, which means that for the first time in some time, they have easily met those costs. So no mention of the WSA, and in actual fact, it appears that they could take even more if they had been just that little bit more aggressive. And regarding this year, 2018, we've already seen that they intend to make the best better. We'll see what that means by April when the Ryzen 2000 series launches on 12 nanometers. Of course, within the next two weeks, we will also see the entry-level Ryzen desktop with Vega graphics. But those are not in 12 nanometers, that's still 14 nanometers. But that might give us a decent indication of what to expect. The big thing for me with the next generation Ryzen is that AMD should not expect that same pent-up demand effect that they had at this time last year. Those initial sales where people were just desperate to get hold of them, I would not expect that to be repeated this year. Regarding graphics, especially for us PC guys, they're going to be expanding the Radeon Vega family, whatever that means. There has been no mention of Polaris this year, so I'm not sure if that whole 12 nanometer Polaris thing has any real weight behind it, or if they're just remaining very coy. There is a chance that Vega could get GDDR5 and 12 nanometers, and perhaps slot in there instead of Polaris, and that would certainly breathe a bit of interest into the graphics market, if nothing else. And finally, the real big thing is at the end of the year, when Zen 2 arrives with Rome. But that's just sampling and we shouldn't look for any benchmarks until probably 2019. Right, so that's me done with this one. These financial ones are mildly interesting to me and hopefully you at least find it the same. Like I said, we are in a pretty quiet period now regarding releases and in actual fact, I'm not even really sure where to go next. So I might take a look at doing one of those different kind of videos. One of those videos where half of you are strongly in support with the other half hating it with a passion. I'll have a think about that over the weekend. But for now, don't forget to like and subscribe. Make sure to check out my links in the description below and I'll catch you later, guys. 